We, are, of course, are continuing our study through the book of Jeremiah, this incredible prophet of God, uh, one of the most famous of all the famous prophets in Jewish history. And, of course, he was really in a crisis because he was faithful to God's call. He didn't want the job. He was also a devout patriot, loved his country, but he was called to preach repentance to the Jews and warn them of judgment that was certain. And as such, he was accused of being a traitor, and he was hated by his own people. Of course, we talk about historically the three uh, primary prophets, these three that are considered three of the four major prophets. They were all uh, contemporaries of each other. And then, of course, the three conquests of Jerusalem. That's important to remember as we study Jeremiah because his ministry accomplished some 40 years. And the fall of Jerusalem was actually in three stages. They literally lost political control officially in 606 B.C., uh, but the city was not destroyed. They were subjugated to Babylon. About, what, nine years later, they were again uh, attacked, uh, or there was a, a preparation for attack, but they surrendered before the siege began. And they came back under cooperation of Jerusalem, or of, of Babylon. Uh, these first two conquests, Daniel was taken in the first, Ezekiel was taken captive in the second. And then finally, some ten years later, after another rebellion uh, to Babylonian authority, they were crushed. They were starved out after an 18-month siege in which the horrors inside the walls of the city were so great that they were literally giving a, 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 a handful of gold for a handful of bird droppings because they had nothing to eat. They were literally eating their own children and the dead bodies of other uh, compatriots inside the walls of the city. And then after that siege, after that being starved out, they wound up being crushed and the city burned and the temple actually destroyed. Now, Jeremiah was called to ministry during a good time, a time where there was perceived spirituality as we're to read through the history of Israel. Under the reign of Josiah, we know he is very sensitive to the Lord's leading, and we had just assumed that the people were as well. Well, not so much as we come to find out. Of course, Josiah died. Uh, he was replaced by subsequently three uh, terms, uh, or actually two lengthy terms and two very short terms. We know and study from Jeremiah primarily the rule of Jehoiakim and the rule of Zedekiah. We are going to see tonight, briefly mentioned in chapter 24, the short reign of Jehoiachin, uh, who was infamously as evil as his father Jehoiakim and was judged accordingly. Tonight we're going to try to get through two chapters. I think we'll be successful in doing so. So let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 23. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Woe is a word that we could translate uh, doom, trouble, damnation, uh, judgment. Judgment be to the pastors, not pastors as you think of as pastors of a congregation, but actually the term pastors means a shepherd or a leader. Literally the word means a keeper, as in a keeper of the flock. And in this particular situation, it's referencing the political leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. It's referencing the spiritual leaders, those being both the priests that had abdicated their divine authority and became pleasers of men and enrichers of themselves, and prophets that were no longer preaching the Word of God, but were again tickling ears and, and, and adhering to the, to the will of the people and enriching themselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that are supposed to be feeding my people, and you haven't done a good job. You have scattered my flock. You have driven them away. You have not cared for them as pastors are supposed to, as shepherds are supposed to, leading and feeding and protecting and gathering the strays that wander off. And as such, I am going to visit you with just judgment because of your wicked behavior. Now, many people have a desire to become teachers. There are some that have a fancy to go into ministry for the wrong reason. 
Now, let me say, if God is calling you to be a teacher or a preacher, that is a wonderful thing, but it's also a very important responsibility. And you have heard me share with you that um, I actually have a defense mechanism. I call it Acts 1711, which I tell you frequently. You can rest assured that neither myself nor Pastor Dan will ever intentionally tell you something that is wrong. Every time we study, we want to present what we are convinced of, not what we just lean to, but what we are absolutely convinced of is absolute truth. However, I also tell you, don't believe a word that I say. <laughs> Acts 17, 11, where Paul complimented the Bereans, because when he came to town after leaving Thessalonica, he proclaimed the truth of Jesus of Nazareth as being the Messiah, and they listened and were quite courteous in listening and taking notes, as is inferred in the Scripture, not specifically stated. But then they got in the Bible to make sure that Paul was correct. So at the same time, I tell you, you can trust what I am telling you because I am not going to mislead you. The reason I'm not going to mislead you is God says that Dan and I and those that are called into positions of teaching will give an account for the job that they do. We will be judged uh, in a different level and to a higher standard in certain areas of our faithfulness as to how faithful we were to this particular calling. So at the same time, we take this very seriously, but I want you to get in the Scripture to make sure that we are right in everything that we teach you. But understand, these pastors had, 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 were an abomination as what they were supposed to be in answering God's calling, and they didn't do the job that God had called them to do. Now God says, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries. So we've gone through 23 chapters or 22 chapters of God promising judgment. But every now and then, just as it seems like, wow, we sure have a dark future as a Judean, as a citizen of the city of Jerusalem, God does come back and encourage them and remind them that in the end, He is going to keep every promise that He has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it all is going to have a glorious ending. As we sit here and are Christians in the United States of America, as we watch the news or read the newspaper, or see what's going on. There are days where we go, wow, uh, it seems like we're losing right now. But we all can encourage ourselves by knowing that in the end, we are on the winning team, and we are still fighting for a daily victory. However, we do know that in the end, we will, in fact, be victorious because uh, we are, will be standing there with King Jesus. And Jeremiah says, or God says to Jeremiah, tell the people, tell the remnant of my flock that I'm going to bring them out of all countries. I want you to take note of this. This has a larger scope than just this short 70-year term. Jeremiah had just said in Jeremiah chapter 20 that God was going to punish them by hauling them off into Babylon, and they would be captivated uh, by the, the empire of Babylon. However, God's promise here in verse 3, which we are going to see continue to unfold, God is going to draw the remnant of Jews out of all countries, whether He has driven them, and He will bring them back into, notice the word, the possessive, their foals, their land, the promised land. And they will, in the end, be fruitful and increase. And at that future set date, God says, I will set up shepherds, pastors, basically the same terminology, over them, which shall feed them, as this unfaithful group of pastors had not done. They will have shepherds that will properly care for them, and they shall fear no more, neither be disappointed, discouraged, dis uh, embarrassed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. When is this talking about? Well, I believe that this is during the future age of the Messiah, what we as Christians typically call the millennial reign of Christ. As a point of reference, Matthew 19, where Jesus was teaching a tough subject, He had dealt with how difficult it is for a rich man to inherit the kingdom because rich men have a tendency of depending upon themselves, their own capabilities. And Peter said, wait a second, we've given up everything to follow you. Uh, are we going to get anything out of the deal? Jesus said in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, truly, Peter, I say unto you and you twelve, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration, in the 
sabbatical year of millenniums in the age of the Messiah when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of His glory you will also sit upon twelve thrones and you specifically you apostles of Israel will judge the twelve tribes of Israel and everyone that hath forsaken houses brethren sisters father mother wife children lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life Ladies and gentlemen, we may actually step into an age where we can experience some of this. As Christians, we haven't had the foggiest idea what they're talking about with this kind of surrender and sacrifice to become a follower of Jesus. But I, trust me, for a first century Jew, if you became a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, whom the Sanhedrin had officially declared was an apostate, you might lose your family. You might lose your job. You might lose your inheritance. Uh, you might be in a, case, a situation where you have to say, well, do I stick with mom and dad or I do I follow Jesus? And sometimes you had to make a decision between one or the other. Well, we haven't experienced that for the most part in Israel or in America. We could come into a time where we do. But Jesus points out, hey, rest assured that right now it seems like some are winning, but in the end they're going to wind up losing and right now it may appear that some of us are losing, but trust me, in the end, we will be winning. Those that are first shall be last, and they that appear to be last now shall in fact be on top. Behold, oh, this is a wonderful passage. The days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David. What's he speaking? The lineage of David, the, the lineage of the kings, a righteous branch. Notice that word is capitalized, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute justice and judgment in not just the promised land, but in the earth. And in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel. Folks, that's all 12 tribes. There are no lost 10 tribes. And they shall dwell safely in the promised land. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. This man that will be ruling and throwing, reigning on the throne of David, judging the world righteously, is in fact the Lord in the flesh. Now, let's see where that comes from. We referenced it briefly last week. Isaiah 11 tells us something. Isaiah was 100 years before the time of Jeremiah. And he said this in this very critical passage to Bible prophecy. And there shall come forth a rod or a shoot out of the stump of Jesse. The idea is that the lineage of the kings, the, the, the throne of David has been so decimated and so humiliated that rather than even referencing it as the house of David, it's called the stump as if it was cut down and nothing left there, as if it was dead, the stump of his father, the shepherd, Jesse. But there's going to be a branch shoot forth. That word netzer in the Hebrew means a rod. It could be a staff, as in protecting the flock. It could also be translated as a scepter, as to rule and reign. And a branch, notice also the capital B, shall grow out of his roots. We'll go through this very quickly because we're not teaching Isaiah 11, but I want to reference it. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. We'll see the sevenfold Spirit that's also referenced in the book of Revelation. The Spirit, by the way, when did we see the Spirit of the Lord resting upon Jesus? Remember at his baptism. The Spirit of the Lord descended from heaven like a dove and anointed him. And a voice from heaven cried out, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. By the way, think of what we taught about Sunday, Deuteronomy 18. There will be a prophet coming after me. He will bring the words of God. Listen to him. It's amazing how this all works together. Almost as if it all had one author. Thank you. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and I shall make him, in other words, he will rule completely in the fear of the Lord. Now, as odd as that is for us to think that the God incarnate works in complete unity with the Father, this will be the perfect uh, king of planet Earth, ruling and reigning in righteousness as God incarnate. 
Make him a quick understanding of the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of eyes, but neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity of the meek on the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. We could cross-reference over to Psalm 2 right now, but we will not. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. In other words, he's going to have the belt. Everything is held together by righteousness, if you knew the attire of the day. And faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. Now, isn't this already happening? Isn't it just, uh, isn't this all been spiritualized in the church age? Well, no, this has not happened, at least not so as we have noticed. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young calf, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling all shall dwell together and dine together, and the lion won't be dining on the calf, they'll be eating grass. And a little child shall lead them in this particular age, and the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion won't eat meat, it will eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the, of the poisonous snake, or what we know to be a poisonous snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, and don't have to worry about being bitten or hurt. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all of my, my kingdom, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, we're not there yet, um, what, Isaiah... Four, Micah 2 talks about this day where we will, where, the, where mankind, as we, we will be ruling and reigning with Jesus in our glorified bodies, but where mankind will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hips, hooks, and there will be no war. Have you noticed such a period of time in our day or in the past 2,000 years or in the past 6,000 years? Nope. I would say that it hasn't happened yet, and I think we're safe to assume that. And in that day there shall be a root out of that stump of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. In other words, a rallying point, a point of salvation for all people, not just to the Jews, but to that rallying point, even the Gentiles shall seek, and his rest, his reign shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord, now this is, I pointed this out because we're going to come back to it, shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people. Now, I want you to notice that at the time that Isaiah is making this prophecy, about 700 plus years B.C., Israel hadn't been taken out of the land the first time. And God is telling Isaiah that after I bring them back the second time is when this guy I'm referencing, this seed of David, this promised Messiah, is going to show up and rule and reign in righteousness. At that point in time, the Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people. By the way, you'll notice here, it will not just be from Babylon. It shall be, if you trace these down, it's, uh, it's, it's wrapped up in verse 12. He shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, which is what He's referencing as His people, or the elect in this particular instance, Folks, don't get hung up. Well, we don't have time to go there right now. But understand, the elect is more than just us. The elect at one time referenced God's people, Israel. And in Matthew 24, where it's talking about the tribulation, the elect that they are attempting to deceive at that point in time is not the church. The church will be gone. The elect that they're trying to deceive at that point in time is this group, the remnant of the Jews that are still left alive during that last seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble, the, uh, the uh, 70th week of Daniel, where that seven years is poured out upon Daniel's people, the Jews, and Daniel's holy city, Jerusalem. Anyway, shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the first of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That's more than just uh, in Babylon. So that is a bigger picture that Jeremiah is talking about here in verses 6 and 7. Now again, we just talked about the branch that was mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 23. We know that Messiah the branch that we just were introduced to in the book of Isaiah is fulfilled four different ways. He is prophesied to be the king of the Jews in Jeremiah 23, 5. Matthew proves how he is, in fact, the fulfillment of the king of the Jews. He is prophesied as a suffering servant uh, in, in Zechariah 3, 8. Mark goes into great depth 
to see prove that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy of the branch. In Luke, he is told that he would be a man whose name is the branch. The book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, goes into great detail proving that Jesus is, in fact, this human uh, that is the Messiah, the branch. And then, of course, John deals with his deity, the branch of the Lord, as is prophesied in Isaiah 4.2. Now, just a moment ago, I referenced that all of Israel, according to what Jeremiah said, would be saved. Now, does that mean that every individual Jew is a Christian? No, of course not. Uh, Paul goes into great detail to talk about that in Romans 9 and 10. Romans 11, Paul speaks forward prophetically to the end, what we would call the end of the tribulation period, or the battle of Armageddon, where it all comes together. And as you have heard me reference, there is Zechariah 9, 9, which talks about the king is going to show up, Israel. He's going to be bringing salvation, riding humbly on a colt, a fold of a donkey, riding over the top of the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14, you see that Israel is going to be under attack. Judah is going to be surrounded. As it says, all nations of the world are going to come together against them in one last act of anti-Semitism, trying to wipe out the Jewish people. Because Satan believes that if he can wipe out the Jews, they can't cry out unto the Lord and the Lord won't return. That's his strategy. It's going to fail. But at Armageddon, the city is surrounded. It says that in Zechariah 14 that half the city has been taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished. And at that point when it looks like all hope is lost, it looks like the Jews are going to finally be annihilated, they will in fact cry out and the Messiah will show up again on the Mount of Olives. This time, not the guy humbly bringing salvation, riding on the colt of a donkey, but this time as King of kings and Lord of lords, coming back, leading the host of heaven. And as you've heard me say somewhat sarcastically, there will be hell to pay at that time. Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness is partially on Israel now, until not the times of the Gentiles be completed, but until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I don't have time to say it and teach it right now, but I would say that that is a reference to the church age in which we live. And so shall, at that point in time, all that's left, all of Israel that has survived the seven years of great tribulation, all of Israel that has rejected the mark of the beast, and it is there holding out at that point in time when the Messiah comes back, they shall see Him with their own eyes. If you read Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 13, they will ask the questions as they are celebrating. They'll say, where did you get the nail prints in your hands? And then the lights are going to come on. And they'll realize why, why they have endured the last 2,000 years of suffering. They'll realize that they had rejected their Messiah when He came in Zechariah 9.9. And here they are. They recognize Him in Zechariah 14.1. And they will receive Him. And that remnant group of Jews will be there as Jesus establishes His millennial kingdom, a literal 1,000-year reign on planet earth from the city of Jerusalem being the capital of the world at that point in time. So all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And for this, my, and this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, Jews are in opposition to the spreading of the gospel of Jesus at this particular point in time. But as concerning the elect, the election, God having chosen Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be the lineage through which the Messiah would be born and ultimately to be His chosen people, God says, I haven't changed my mind. The Father still loves them for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So God hasn't changed His mind in any of this. All right, back to Jer Jeremiah chapter 23 as we see the long-term big picture prophecy it's talking about here. Verses 7, 8, confirm this. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more talk about what a great job God did when He brought us out of captivity in the land of Egypt. But instead, they're going to talk about the Lord lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and 
from all countries, plural, whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in heaven. No, what's it say? Literally their own land. If you're a Jew sitting there receiving this message from Jeremiah, you would understand that to be the promised land. And I would concur with that. Now, looking quickly at the history of Israel. From Abraham's call through the destruction of the temple in 6, or excuse me, roughly 587 B.C., that is what you see on the screen. You see Abraham, you see his sons, uh, you see Jacob and Esau, you see Jacob's 12, uh, you see the 12 sons of Jacob, uh, you see their captivity in Egypt after Joseph was sold into slavery. You see Moses to lead them out of bondage. You see Joshua leading them into the promised land. You see the 400 years uh, of the Republic of Israel and the time of the judges. And then you see their disobedience and their call for a king. First, you see Saul, then David, then Solomon, then the division of the kingdom, the north and south, and the different kings in the north, and the Judean uh, line of, of kings of David in the south. Then you see the disobedience where we're dealing with in depth right now with Jeremiah, Babylonian captivity. By the way, as they are hauled off into captivity, they no longer have a king. And the Scripture says that they will dwell for many days without a king, and we are seeing that now. The first return, which Isaiah referenced in chapter 11, was when Zerubbabel led them back. Now, let's pause right here just for a moment. Now, the last verse we just saw here, it said there is going to be a deliverance that puts the, the deliverance from captivity in Egypt to shame. In fact, it's going to overwhelm that so much that you'll not even remember the deliverance from captivity in Egypt. Now, think about what happened the first go-round. They'd, they'd been in Egypt for about 400 years. They were slave race with no hope. Moses shows up, goes to Pharaoh, says, God says to let his people go. What was Pharaoh's response? No, they're not going anywhere. So, there is a confrontation between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Jews, the God of Moses, and the God's of the most powerful military and nation on earth. And by the way, in their thinking, every land had gods associated with that land. So the gods of, of uh, Edom were different than the gods of Egypt. The gods of, of um, um, what? Well, yeah, Canaan. Uh, yes, yeah, they, you're right. They were pagan. Exactly. We're different than these other gods. So every area had gods associated with that area. And since Egypt was ruling the world at that time, the gods of Egypt were obviously more powerful than all the other gods. Well, in those ten plagues poured out, you saw Yahweh going head to head with the God of the Nile and the God of fertility and the God of produce and the God of the sun and all that and destroying the gods of Egypt. And then at the end of the day, Pharaoh finally said, okay, take the people and get out. Then he had a change of heart, chased them down to the Red Sea, and it looks like they were in trouble as the Jews were backed up, hemmed in by the wilderness, up against the Red Sea. You had the Egyptian army there in their chariots. It looked like, again, there was no chance when the Shekinah intervened, the pillar of a flame from heaven, and God divided the Red Sea, and the Jews walked through on dry land. Then when the Egyptians attempted to follow them, the waters covered them up, destroyed them all. Then that's not the end of the story. God leads them even in their disobedience and feeds them for 40 years in the wilderness. Every day they wake up, there's food on the ground. Imagine waking up and finding, what did you all have for dinner tonight? Um, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A sandwiches on the ground. Well, that would get old after 40 years. Nevertheless, it'd be a miracle. God says their shoes never wore out. 40 years in the wilderness brought them to the promised land. General Joshua led this ragtag group in and destroyed the kings of Canaan over a period of seven years, and God gave them this land. That's a pretty impressive story, don't you think? Now, let's compare that to what happened here. After 70 years in captivity, King Cyrus had it brought to his attention that Isaiah had prophesied that he specifically by name would release the Jewish people and showed him this passage in the Jewish text of Scripture. King Cyrus was so impressed, he said, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. And he gave the Jews permission to return 
to their promised land. Not only that, but he funded their effort. Not only that, but he provided them some military protection as they left. Now, out of some 2 million Jews estimated that were in Babylon, less than 50,000 returned. If you read in uh, uh, the Scripture, you add it all up, 49,917. Now, let's compare those two. You have 2 million Jews being brought out of slavery in Egypt with a Pharaoh that says, you're not going anywhere. God performs 10 supernatural miracles, ending with the death of the firstborn, then delivering them through the Red Sea, then providing for them for 40 years in the wilderness, then taking them into the Promised Land where they defeated a people that were more powerful than they were. That's pretty impressive. Versus King Cyrus giving them permission to leave, only 50,000 of the 2 million choosing to leave because life was pretty good for them in Babylon, and then providing funding for them to get there. Now, which of those do you think is more impressive? I would say the first one is more impressive. But we just read in Jeremiah that their next deliverance is going to be so impressive that you're going to forget all about that account in the Exodus. Now, the first return, you have Zerubbabel, you had what we call the minor prophets, you had the revival of Ezra, you had Nehemiah going back and rebuilding the walls of the city, wrapping up in Malachi with a promise of a continuation uh, next thing we're going to see is this crazy evangelist named John the Baptist, and then the Messiah is going to show up. We see historically the Maccabean revolt, which is not talked about in Scripture. We know historically the rise of Rome and the conquest of that area in the Holy Land. We know that King Jesus showed up just as Zechariah 9, 9 said. So again, we wind up here at no king. All of a sudden, we have the king, but he's rejected. We see the city destroyed 38 years later and the temple destroyed. Now, we see the second return beginning almost 2,000 years later. For almost 2,000 years, Israel had no place to call home. And you know what happens when you don't have a place to call home? You wind up assimilating into other cultures. Do you know any, um, um, oh, good grief, what was uh, Goliath? Uh, Goliath was a Philistine. Do you know any Philistines? Why is that? Because there's no longer a Philistia. Do you know any Edomites? Why is that? Because there's no longer an Edom. There are still descendants. If you did that Ancestry.com, you might find that you're related to a Philistine somewhere. But you have lost that connection because there's no land. Well, guess what? Israel went for almost 2,000 years and never lost their identity. Part of that was because God, God had a purpose for establishing the kosher laws and all the odd things that the Jews are supposed to do to remain distinct from other cultures. Then in 1948, after the Dreyfus affair, Captain Dreyfus, a member of the French military, was accused of treason, even though the overwhelming evidence said he was innocent. Nevertheless, they convicted him and sent him to Devil's Island anyway because of anti-Semitism. That was a famous case that gained notoriety worldwide. From that, this a non-religious Jew named Theodore Herzl began what was called the Zionist movement. He said, obviously there's anti-Semitism. We Jews can never have any peace until we have our own land and our own borders. Otherwise, we will always be hunted and hated. Obviously, after that, you had the Balfour Declaration in 1917. Then you had World War II. You had the Holocaust which convinced everybody that what Herzl said was in fact true. After the World War II, you had David Ben-Gurion. You had the people returning from the, the Holocaust camps to Israel from all around the world. The return began. And May the 14th, 1948, the Declaration of Independence for the Nation of Israel, they were immediately attacked by at least five Arab nations that surrounded them. They had 19,000 men under arms. They had no tanks, no aircraft. They were attacked by five nations with armies and tanks and aircraft, and they won. That's a miracle. They were attacked again in 1967, or there was a preparation for an attack in 1967. And they again, they were overwhelmingly outnumbered. But Israel had a preemptive strike and wiped out in the Six-Day War. You know the old joke, why did they have to wrap it up in six days? Because they had to rest on the Sabbath. Exactly. Another miracle. Yom Kippur War, 1973, another miracle. There was no logical explanation for there to be a nation of Israel today. 
other than God said there would be. There is no way that those people should have maintained an identity, but they did. No way they should have survived all the persecutions through the years, including the Holocaust, but they did. No way they should have won their war for independence, but they did. They're, they are still standing at present, but still have no king. Guess what's going to happen next? Next thing is going to be the rapture of this mystery body called the church. God's focus is going to be back on Israel in the 70th week of Daniel, literally taking place on planet earth. And then Armageddon is the end of that. And when it looks like it's all over, the king arrives, establishes his kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ. Everything that's prophesied here in this book and in other books of prophecy will actually be fulfilled on planet earth. Jeremiah, back to Jeremiah. All of the, did you know all that was in verses 4, 5, 6, and 7? Well, it was, really. I mean, I'm not, it really was. But yeah, in fact, we could spend hours continuing to ferret out more information. Mine heart, Jeremiah says, I'm brokenhearted. I'm overcome with grief because of these prophets, these false prophets. All my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man. I can't even stand up. I'm like a man whom wine over overcame again because the Lord, because of the words of His holiness. When I consider how we are behaving as a people and what God has set as a standard for us, I'm just, I'm just brokenhearted. For the land of Israel is full of adulterers, literally and spiritually. Oh, by the way, boy, doesn't that sound like us? And because the land of, is full of swearing, this does not mean cursing. This means false oaths, illegal, illegitimate business deals, deception, and the pleasant. And as such, there is a drought that's being poured out on the land. The pleasant place of the wilderness and dried up because uh, the priests, their course is evil. They're following an evil path. And their uh, power is not being used properly, is what that's being said. Their power is not rightly used. Their force is not right. For both the prophet, who is supposed to be speaking God's word to the people, and the priest, who are supposed to be interceding to God on behalf of the people, are profane. That word profane means they are defiled. They are polluted. They are absolutely bankrupt. They are spiritually corrupt. Even what goes on inside the house of the Lord, the walls of the temple. Wherefore, their way, not God's way, their way, if you follow that path, shall be just as if you were driving on the icy roads of Oklahoma during an ice storm. How, how does that work out? Not very, a windy road during an ice storm. Doesn't work out very well, and that's what he's saying here in verse 12. And I have seen the folly in the prophets of Samaria. What's that referencing? Remember, uh, Samaria was this area in the north. After Solomon's raid, the kingdom was divided with ten States geographically to the north, two states geographically to the south, different sets of kings. Immediately the north went off into idolatry. I have seen the folly of the false prophets of Samaria as they prophesied to Baal and caused my people, Israel, to error, to err in their ways. And what happened as a result of that? God sent Prophets, true prophets like Elijah and Elisha to preach repentance. What happened? They ignored God's message. God sent drought. God sent famine. God sent all sorts of efforts to try to get their attention, and they ignored it. Finally, in 722, Assyria came in and conquered the north. Verse 14, you would think you would have learned something from that. But instead, I'm watching the prophets of Jerusalem do the same things. They commit adultery. They walk. And again, that means more than just taking a stroll. The Hebrew concept of the word halak means their whole life. Their whole lifestyle is one of deception. Also, those prophets who are supposed to be preaching repentance and returning to God instead are encouraging or strengthening the behavior of the evildoers. And as a consequence, since they aren't preaching repentance, None turns from their wickedness, and consequently, all of Israel, all of Judah has become to me as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, here at the temple complex, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I will feed them with wormwood. A wormwood was a type of plant in that area. It made their drink bitter. It could even be poisonous with what is inferred by the reference to the waters of Gaul. I will feed them or will make them to drink bitter water is what the Lord is saying through Jeremiah. And I will, they will drink uh, hemlock, 
because the prophets of Jerusalem and their profaneness has gone forth throughout all the land. Thus saith Jehovah Sabbath, the warrior Lord, the Lord of God's armies. Hearken not unto the words of these false prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain, empty spiritually. Oh, they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me. So you, here you have the people living in Judah that despise the Lord. What are the prophets doing about it? They say, peace, shalom, everything is going to be all right. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, don't worry, no evil shall come upon you. So what's Jeremiah doing? Jeremiah is preaching, repent. Jeremiah is saying, listen, we're going down the wrong path here. God is going to judge us. The false prophets were saying, Jeremiah's a liar. Jeremiah didn't know what he's talking about. Here, look, look, there's the temple. Temple's right over here. God lives here. We're his people. We've got nothing to worry about. God's promised us peace. We don't put repentance. We're doing just fine. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? And who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, no one. Behold, a whirlwind. Whenever you see whirlwind, what do we think of when we see a tornado? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. Same thing here. A whirlwind of judgment of the Lord has gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, and it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return. In other words, God is not going to change His mind on this. Judgment is coming. The, Lord's not going to change, the anger of the Lord shall not return until He hath executed it till he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. And in the last days, you shall consider it. You shall have a perfect understanding of what I'm talking about uh, after it's happened, Jeremiah is saying. I, God says through Jeremiah, I have not sent these prophets, yet they went. By the way, I think that speaks of a lot of modern day pastors. I think they are mama called or career oriented and not God called. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil way and from their evil doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? What, they're say what God is saying here is, do you really think that I'm not paying attention? Do you really think I've wandered a long way away and I'm not looking at what you're doing? I'm not observing everything that's going on here as if you're hiding from me? I'm not taking note of your disobedience? Really, you think that's going on? And I have heard, God says, what the prophets said. Those prophets that prophesy lies in my name. Obviously, you had Jeremiah that was faithful. You had uh, 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 Ezekiel that was faithful. You had Daniel that was faithful. There were faithful prophets. But these false prophets, the ear-tickling preachers that drew the big audiences, the name it and claim it, your best life now type preachers that are so enjoyable to listen to and to be encouraged and have motivational speech every week, but no calls to holiness, no uh, shame over sin, no demand of repentance. Instead, you have these prophets that aren't preaching the Word of God, they're saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Folks, I know a lot of good people. Dan and I were just talking in my office a little while ago uh, before I came in here. We've got some really good friends that I know are believers that are of the charismatic persuasion. Uh, I don't understand it. The Lord has never spoken to me in the shower. I've got a good friend that gets his daily marching orders in the shower, it seems like. It must just be a, a direct line of communication uh, to heaven when he's in there with his soap. I have, uh, I have heard, uh, well, we've all heard it the last year. How many times have you heard these, good, these men prophesying about a second term for Donald Trump or prophesying this or prophesying that? I had well-intentioned people call me when I was running for office that told me to encourage me that God had spoken to them and that I was going to be elected to the state senate and all this stuff. Well, guess what? Didn't happen. You know what the Scripture has to say about a false prophet? 
I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people, uh, and the reality is I don't know if they are having a nightmare or whether they are the subject of wishful thinking in their dreams. Heavens, I'm not putting it beyond God's ability. If God wanted to speak to one of us in a dream, He could do it. He's God. But when somebody tells me their prophecy, I don't know that that's anything more than a nightmare or uh, a wishful thinking. But when I read something in Scripture, I know that that's something we can hang our hat on. We know that that is the Word of God. So when somebody says, oh, I've had a vision or I've had a prophecy, well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Maybe that was just indigestion from your dinner last night. Pastor, yes, sir. God's Word be or make Absolutely, John. That is God's Word, and it has been established and well proven. As we have said uh, on many times, I'm sure Dan and I will talk about it in the next couple of weeks, you know, a, a Jewish believer named Alfred Eidersham in the 18th, 1800s, uh, since he grew up as a Hasidic Jew, went back through the Old Testament and identified 456 specific prophecies that were proof that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah in His first coming. You know what? That's a pretty good record. I think we can stand on this Word. Now, here's the encouraging thing. There are more than double that that are still referencing His second coming. So, if the first coming happened, just as the Word says, we've got a great deal of confidence that the second coming is going to happen just as well. So we know the Bible is true. We don't know about this prophesying. Now let's look here. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name, and instead have substituted Yahweh with Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, okay, let him tell a dream, aha, uh -huh. but he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Now, the point I want to make here is the chaff in verse 28 would be those prophets that are preaching dreams. The wheat would be those prophets that are preaching the Word of God faithfully. So if you want to see the difference between a tear from the wheat, it's those that are speaking God's Word faithfully is most certainly wheat. You guys know that we may not always be eloquent in our delivery, but Pastor Dan and I will always only preach the Word of God. If we offer an opinion, we will preface it with, this is my opinion on a particular subject. But my opinion is of no more value than anybody else's opinion. But the Word of God is true, and we can rest on that. So I would say that the same message should be heard in our day about the dreamers of dreams versus those that are faithfully preaching the Scripture. We're going to stop right there. I no, I take that back. We still have just a couple more verses. We're going to finish, we'll finish this chapter. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, God says, I am against the prophets. They steal the words, they steal my words from everyone and from his neighbor. Again, what's the prophet of God supposed to be doing? Declaring God's words to the people. These false prophets were withholding God's Word to the people, and instead speaking their visions, their dreams. Behold, I am against the prophets. That's not a good thing to hear, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, God saith. Okay, they say with their tongue, God says this when God hasn't said that. Again, remember the reference a while ago when we went back to James and the higher standard of account that, that teachers and preachers will give for the job that they do. Same thing is consistent here. It's consistent through all Scripture. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit uh, this people at all. In other words, listening to these false prophets that are prophesying lies will not benefit the people. As a matter of fact, they, these crummy preachers 
are encouraging the people in their error. And at the end of the day, they're all going to wind up paying for it. By the way, the reference in verse 29, you know, the idea of a hammer or the idea of fire in Scripture speaks of power, speaks of judgment, speaks of purification in any of those uh, veins. All right, I think we do, we're about to wrap up here. We're not going to get into the next, next chapter. You can breathe a sigh of relief. And when this people or prophet or priest shall ask thee, saying, <laughs> what is, oh, here's what, I'm sorry, I'm leading, there would be a time, in fact, we saw it last week, where when the, they look outside the walls of the city and they see that they are surrounded. And they are actually starting to get pretty hungry. And things aren't looking good. God's telling Jeremiah, these people are going to come to you and ask, has, has God spoken to you? Have you heard a word from the Lord, Jeremiah? Well, there is a word play in the Hebrew. I've told you before that there's only about 7,000 old Hebrew words. We've got about 100,000 words in English. Each word you have to look at in context to understand what's being referenced specifically. However, there is a lot of sarcasm and wordplay in the Bible, and we're seeing that here. What is the burden? That word masa in the Hebrew, the, the, prophet, or these, the, the leaders, these false prophets are coming saying, what is the oracle? Uh, literally, this word means a, a, uh, something that has been delivered to you or placed upon you. Uh, God, uh, uh, Jeremiah, what has God delivered to you? What, 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 what message has He given you? And here's what you shall say to them. Now, that same word can be translated judgment that's placed on you. So, in one vein, they're saying, what, what oracle, what word from the Lord has He given you? In another vein, it can be used, what judgment has God placed upon you because of your disobedience? So, that's the word play here. They're coming to Jeremiah saying, Jeremiah, have you gotten a word from the Lord? And, and Jeremiah is saying, yeah, the same one that He gave you yesterday. You're going to be judged. All right. Thou shalt say this unto them, what burden? You mean this one? I'm going to forsake you. Huh. How much clearer can I say this? I'm going to forsake you because of your disobedience. And as for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say, the burden of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. In other words, you speak falsely. You say that you are declaring my oracles falsely. I'm going to punish that man and his whole household. Thus shall you say everyone to his neighbor and everyone to his brother, what hath the Lord answered and what hath the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more. For every man's word shall be his burden, for they have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, uh, that hath, uh, the, What hath the Lord answered thee, and what hath the Lord spoken? But since you say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because you say this word, the burden of the Lord, I have said unto you, saying, You shall not say the burden of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, utterly forget you, and will forsake you and the city that I gave you and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence, and I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame that shall not be forgotten. We'll close with this. We no longer have a fear of the Lord. In the modern American church, our emphasis is wholly on God's grace. And consequently, we think that God is just going to sit by and nod at everything we do as we continue to live in sin. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are supposed to be following Christ in every area of our life. Every part of our life should be a testimony to the Savior that we've trusted. And some pastors have even exploited this to the point of saying, well, you can be a practicing homosexual and still be right in the middle of God's will. That is impossible. That's like saying you can be a, 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 a you can continue to live in any sin. You can be a, a cheater, a thief, uh, a murderer, uh, whatever, and be right in the middle of God's will. No, you can't. We all are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing. And our sins are 100% paid for by His finished work on the cross and by His shed blood. However, and even as Christians, we still will have temptations. However, as Christians, it's never okay to go off into sin, nor to condone it, just as what was happening in this chapter as we studied it. We have to realize that God's love is literal, and because of God's love, He has offered us forgiveness 
uh, through the finished work of Christ Jesus, but God's justice is also there as well. If we reject God's gift of eternal life, if we reject the Lord Jesus, if we reject the Son, then we are going to stand before Him one day giving an account for our own sins. And then we will hear, we won't, hopefully nobody in this room, the last words that person will hear is, depart from me, you cursed, I never knew you. So we are all sinners, yes. God loves us so much that He gave Jesus to pay for our sins. Our sin debt has been paid for and is offered to each and every one of us. But if we reject Jesus, then we will experience God's wrath and justice. And as Paul said in Hebrews 10, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We see this should make people quake right here when they see this. When God says to those that were Jews living in Jerusalem, I am going to, every promise that I made to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to carry it out. It's not going to happen to you. Too late for you. You've rejected me. You are going to experience my just wrath. And that's not harsh. That's just. That's justice. All right, next week we'll pick up in chapter 24. Uh, I, it's a short chapter. We can blaze through it, but we're not because we're out of time.